Okay, welcome everybody um, to this event as part of the Festival of Politics 2024. It's so wonderful to see so many of you here and such a wide ranging audience. Um, welcome to the Scottish Parliament as well. It's such a pleasure to be here on behalf of the Young Women's Movement. I am Anastasia Ryan. I am the chairperson of the Young Women's Movement. Um, and I'd like to welcome you today to the 2024 Festival of Politics opening session. This year celebrates the festival's 20th year of provoking, inspiring and informing people of all ages and from all walks of life to engage in five days of spirited debate and politics. I'm really looking forward to this discussion this morning and hearing everybody's thoughts and views. It's important that everybody is given the opportunity to contribute even where there may be differences of opinion. So just as a reminder that where there are conflicts or conflicting ideas, that we treat one another with respect. We are delighted you can join us today to participate in this consent panel in partnership with the Young Women's Movement and the Scottish Youth Parliament. And later, I will be inviting you to get involved through submission of questions and also some comments towards the end. So the discussion today will cover some topics that may be difficult for audience members to hear. Um, if you need to take a break at any point, please do so. The door is there and you can go outside and take a break. If you're a young person who is needing support um, or believes you need support after this panel, you can contact Childline. We have their number here for you. Or if you have any concerns about a child, you can contact the NSPCC helpline. If you are keen to throw your thoughts out there, you can do so using at Visit Scott Parl on Twitter or on Instagram. We'd love you to do so. Um, and just to let you know, the event is also being recorded and will be, able to, but will be available to view on the festival website next week. Just to let you know as well, we've got BSL um, up on the monitor here. And when we are writing our questions into Menti, which I'll give you further instruction on how to do, they will appear on this screen here. Okay, so I am very pleased to be joined here today by Professor Kirsten Mitchell, Tia Heppelwhite, and Christy Donovan. So Professor Kirsten Mitchell um, leads a program of research at the University of Glasgow on social relationships and health. Tia Heppelwhite and Christy Donovan have been members of Bold Girls Ken, a partnership project between NSPCC and the Young Women's Movement since 2022. So Bold, Bold Girls Ken is a youth-led campaign on consent which aims to educate young people to know what consent is both on and offline and to ensure that young people get realistic and appropriate information around consent and ensure that they know where to go for help when it's needed. This forms part of a national and a regional campaign called Young Women Know, designed to tackle unhealthy relationships and peer sexual abuse through peer-led campaigns. There will be an opportunity to ask questions from the audience via Menti, um, and views can be put to the panelists for answering and for comment. However, if I may, I may start with some questions that we have um, prepared for the session today. So firstly, and probably coming to you first, Kirsten, do you think the current Scottish curriculum adequately covers the issue of consent? Um, I, I would say yes. And when I say yes, I'm thinking of the um, RSHP uh, resource that's available online. Um, it's whether it's delivered in every school um, and given the full attention and it given um, delivered in a safe way that allows people to discuss the issues is, is another matter. But I do think we're actually very lucky in Scotland. I don't think there are very many countries worldwide that have a fully comprehensive resource um, and that cover uh, sexual health, particularly in quite a positive way. It's quite open. It's, it's very... Um, it's not trying to sort of gloss over issues. It, it, it covers them all. And the thing, the thing I like about the way that consent is covered is that it starts early. So it's not something that the resource is not saying, this is for senior school pupils only. It's, it, and you, know, you wait till you, you're kind of 14 and then we'll tell you about consent. It actually starts right from primary level. And it's about teaching young uh, people that they need to respect 
um, the desires and wishes of other people and that might be in a game or you know in a toy fight if a, if a, a friend says you know stop respecting that and so actually the sort of principles that underlie consent start right from a young age um, and we can we can talk about them so that it just becomes natural when we start talking about sex that they already get what that means um, paying attention to what someone else is saying and and listening out for those cues about whether somebody's happy or or unhappy so yeah i think it's good brilliant i think it'll be really great to hear the audience's views on this as well um around what is actually being been taught in school and how that's been received at some point but i'll just come to tia and christy what are your views around the current scottish curriculum um, on consent specifically um i think personally so we've both just finished school so we've just been through the system and the way that we were taught it wasn't as fluent as it should have been so it was quite bitty and it wasn't as flowing as you would have thought yeah it kind of became a little bit of an awkward subject in school i think because like you were saying like starting younger i feel like it's kind of lacking in that and that lots of different schools have experienced different things so it's not constant in like every school and for us especially we found that like you said, it didn't flow because one day you were learning about consent and the next it had completely switched subjects and it wasn't constant and you kind of, because it was so bitty, you kind of felt that you weren't really learning it properly because it was just that thing you just covered once and then moved on. Um, I think also the way that we were taught it, we weren't taught it in a way that it was, this is what it looks like in a day-to-day -day relationship. Like It was more here's the horror stories, this is what it looks like when consent's gone as bad as it physically could have been. We were only taught it like that, we weren't taught this is what healthy relationships look like. It was more a, uh, so this is what an unhealthy relationship looks like, these are the signs of it, it's not this is a healthy relationship. So, um, yeah. I feel like one of the main things that we felt was lacking is obviously um, times change and social media has become such a large part of it and I think that that's quite often not mentioned in terms of consent. Okay, that's really interesting. So hearing it's kind of patchwork maybe across um, Scotland in terms of how it's taught, how in depth it's taught. Often it's the kind of extremes of consent or, or the lack of consent in terms of those extremes rather than day-to-day -day negotiation of consent and then potentially not keeping up with the digital age and what influences young people now. It's really interesting. So given those issues, how do you think that the current curriculum around consent could be improved? We'll start with you, Christy, if you're happy. Um, so the way that like we've had discussions about this through both Girls Ken and the Young Women Know, we kind of thought that the way that they could make it the best is bring it up in other classes. Like, don't keep it to a, this is purely for PSE and that is it. So the way that our school did it, we... Um, we kind of did it through English, which I personally thought that it meant a lot of the people didn't realise that it was such a big topic. Like, it was just, you were learning about it and then it would carry on the conversation instead of keeping it in a one confined space where you have to talk about it in a certain way. Okay. Yeah, we were trying to... Well, we think like making it more comfortable, obviously discussing it at other places in school rather than like restricting it to a classroom and just making it more of a normal topic, just something you discuss anyway, not something that you have to learn and you have to sit through. And in a specific context, like yeah. in, in, in one class setting. Yeah, because we read a book in English, so it meant that people had to engage and they learnt a lot from just reading the books, so it was good. Around it. Okay, yeah, this seems like a really concrete and great idea. Kirsten, do you have any ideas around how the curriculum might be improved? Yeah, I mean, I think it's great to hear that you're learning about consent in uh, classes outside of, of PSE, and I think that is really important, and it's great that your school was able to do that. I think, just to pick up on what you were saying before, I think... I, I, I mean, I think it, you confirmed what I suspected was there's like quite a lot of variability between one school and another and 
when I said, like, the, when I was talking about the curriculum is good, I think the resources are there, but whether teachers get that support or feel comfortable, like, talking about these things um, is, a, is another matter. So it's not just the, having the curriculum, but also supporting the teachers. And, um, but, and also there has to be a kind of environment where people feel safe to talk about the issues. So uh, they, you can't just deliver from the, from the front and then it's right job done. We've talked about consent, that's it. Um, I, I wanted to also, I thought you made a great point that um, there is a tendency to think of consent as, um, yeah, just trying to protect young people from the, the bad stuff. Um, that's really important, but I think it has a bit of a flip side. I mean, one is that it can make people very anxious and, um, and kind of worried about sex itself, whereas, you know, the ideal is sex is something that is, is pleasurable and something that brings a lot of joy to people's lives. And so we, when we just hammer home the this risk and that risk and that could happen, I think that adds another thing to worry about. So I really agree with you that I think... Um, there's the consent that um, relates to the legal things that are happening, which is about um, did you want, did you not get permission? Is this a, you know is this a kind of was this a consensual um, sexual experience in the eyes of the law? But then there is the everyday everyday um, sexual interactions that you have once you start having uh, romantic partners. Most everyday sexual encounters are consensual. And so, actually, there's a lot of subtlety involved, and I think schools really need to be conveying, conveying that. So we, get, we have these consent messages, yes means yes, and that's all important from a point of view of uh, preventing sexual assault and rape. But at the same time, people need to also recognise that in a, a relationship where there's trust and respect going on, some of the, the, the communication about consent can be... Um, but people are actually quite adept at recognising, if they're respecting each other, they're quite adept at recognising when somebody's communicating consent in all sorts of ways. And also I think uh, schools could do more to talk about the differences between wantedness and consent. Mm -hmm. So you can, it is possible for someone to give consent to something that they don't actually want to do. Uh, my son would say like an injection. He might give him consent for an injection, but he doesn't actually want that injection. And that's the same. So people can consent to sex, to sex. In, a, in a long term relationship. You might be feeling tired. You don't particularly want to have sex, but you still consent. And that's still a consensual relationship. So understand uh, sexual uh, interaction. So understanding that difference between wanting something and how you feel inside and how you're communicating that. So there's a lot of depth to the topic of consent whereas I think people think have you covered consent did you teach people how to say an emphatic yes during a, during an encounter well, that's job done I don't think it is a job done you know and yeah. um, hearing there's a lot of kind of nuance within the topic of consent but also our our day-to-day -day interactions and how that might play out within them I wonder sometimes in schools whether there's a time restriction, but as you say, with teachers in terms of training, but also comfortability in terms of having these conversations with pupils as well. Um, do you think that the relationship, sexual health and parenthood education should be mandatory as part of the curriculum? Um, I, yeah, it definitely should be. And I feel like it almost needs to be covered differently, though, because... The way it's been taught at the moment, as, I, as we spoke about, it's not really together, it doesn't really make sense and it doesn't flow. So by changing maybe the order of how they teach things or when they teach it could really benefit people. Okay. Yeah, I think that was a point that we often almost got annoyed about in school. It was, it was almost like we were getting taught it at the wrong time or it was just a box they had to tick and that was it. So I think it is a definite, yes, it needs to be taught in school. But I also think it needs to be taught in more of a relatable way instead of this is what we have to talk about and this is when we have to talk about it or just we'll throw it in there and we'll throw it in there, we've got some spare time because that's what it often felt like, at least for us. Okay, that's really interesting. Kirsten, any further thoughts on... The man, whether it should be mandatory within all schools? 
Um, I, I, I do think it should be. Um, and I think the reason to have it mandatory is, is more important now than ever. Because I think, as, I think young people um, are always going to be curious about, about sex. They'll have questions. They want to know answers. And if they don't learn it in, in school, and many of them, many young people aren't, you know, it's difficult to talk to um, parents, then uh, they will find, they'll find, you know, they find, young people find ways to get information. Um, and so now, you know, that information is just on the internet, uh, but not all of it is right or helpful or healthy. Um, and, you know, y young people will teach themselves if they're not being taught at school. And I think it's, a, we've got, a, a, a schools have a really strong responsibility to let, give young people just the information that they need to support them to have healthy relationships in future. And if they don't, if, if they don't do that, then that gap is just gonna be filled by um, just rumours, uh, inaccurate stuff on the internet, pornography, stuff circulating on uh, social media, um, some of which is great, but some of which isn't actually true. Um, and yeah, you need to give young people those resources to be able to say that's true, that's not true, um, and that's right, that's not right. Um, so, yeah, it's a really big responsibility, I'd say, now more than ever. And like we were talking earlier in terms of, I guess, social media influencers by entrusting social media platforms and other resources, how do we know that that's completely accurate and it's not kind of biased or one-sided as well? Um, okay, brilliant. So, I think in terms of the current curriculum around consent um, and at the young women's movement, we champion kind of co-creation and co-design with young women on, on everything that we do. And I know that that was a big part of this partnership with NSW, NSPCC as well. I'd be really interested to know um, from all of you, but maybe starting with Tia and Christy, why do you think it's important that young people's voices are central in these discussions around consent? Um, I think... It's just kind of, we know what we've missed out. Like, especially now, the age that we are, we've kind of seen the gaps that we've needed. Mm -hmm. um, like, we've needed to be filled in. So I don't know. It just, it makes sense to ask the people who have just been taught it instead of people who are trying their best but aren't in that situation because like the age that we're at, the 16, 17, 18 year olds, it often feels like adults are making decisions for us when they're not the ones being affected by it. More broadly than consent. Yeah, generally. like just in general. Yeah. So I think a lot of the time, if all you need to do is ask, where did we go wrong? Where did we go right? It's good to get both of those points and you can take that and help the next generation. Yeah, for when we were working with World Girls Can and like when we were discussing it, we discovered that just through talking with each other, we found so many things that we had missed. And also like while we were talking about it, we learned the things we'd missed. So it's almost like just hearing people's opinions, you can benefit so much and see what they've missed and also help them help people see that they need to learn it or help them learn it. Yeah, amazing. Kirsten. Um, absolutely, we need to be always talking to young people. And I think even just now, you've both proved the importance of that because, so for instance, just by even making the comment that there's an issue with sequencing, and it's when, you, when you're, you're on the receiving end of the sex education, it feels bitty, it feels disjointed. That is something that, you know, the, um, the creators of the resource need to know and I and I do know them so I'll feed it back to them <laughs> but do you know what I mean we, we we couldn't sit you know the the people making the resource and building the resources couldn't kind of sit around in a room and and know that so it's just all the way through and I think particularly 
I mean, I would say it in any aspect of health services, but particularly things like sex education, sexual health services, because it can be quite sensitive, quite taboo, quite difficult to ask. It's, they're not topics that come up naturally in, in conversations. There's an even stronger need to make sure that young people are involved. Um, I, I'd say that there is a willing, that's from Scottish Government, there's a willingness there, but there's not always the resources, I think, sometimes to really do a proper, um, to do things in ways that fully involve young people from, from the outset. And I think another challenge um, often is getting young men to take part as well as young women. I think young women are very um, active um, and have uh, lots of lots to give and lots to say. I think young men do too, but it's quite harder to get them, it's a bit harder to get them to come forward, is my experience of doing research with young people. I think yeah. we seen that like through being in PSE and that but going back to when we were in English we did this hearing a lot of the guys just talk about it so casually was kind of eye-opening because I think it gave you another viewpoint because normally in PSE with a lot of the horror stories it's quite often a guy is being almost the villain but in reality it can happen both ways and to see what the guys in our class were thinking, the guys our year, it was very eye-opening. That's really interesting. Mm. And that was within a different setting from PSE, which potentially kind of allowed that conversation to take place in different ways and made people feel more comfortable to come forward with their opinions and experiences as well. Um, <laughs> excuse me, I have one more question on my list. But just in preparation for moving to audience questions, um, I'd like to just point out Menti. If people have phones or they have laptops and you can access Menti, brilliant if you could post, um, enter the code and post your questions via Menti. However, we also have post-it notes, which Elna and Jenny can come around with. So feel free to write down your question. It can be brought up to the panel at that point as well. <coughs> Sorry. I'm talking too much. Let you guys talk some more. So, why are, it's a really important one, um, and I think that you'll have a lot, of, a lot to say about this, given your work with Bold Girls Ken. Uh, why are projects and campaigns around consent important? Well, for the starters, like we've touched on, it, having, like, having the discussion and having campaigns and stuff has allowed us to see what we're missing out on and what we want to talk about and I think mainly for us for our campaign a large part of it was making sure that consent wasn't a taboo subject and changing it because at the moment it is. Yeah I think especially with Bold Girls Ken it gave us the opportunity to get more comfortable and get more knowledgeable because I think when you know a lot more about the subject instead of guessing about it you just feel more comfortable and have the ability to just speak about it without worrying you're going to say the wrong thing but i think as well with our campaign we the group of girls we had was so understanding but we also came up with a lot of safe space agreements we had our um arrangements so we knew if we needed a moment out or if we wanted to take a step back um, that we could and everything we said was in confidence and it wouldn't escalate from there unless it needed to. Yeah, I think especially for us, we did it with a, like a group of people who weren't f from our school but it allowed us to go back to our school and like spread it further. So we've spoken, we spoke to our PSE teachers and spoke to them about things that we thought they could do to improve and they like really took it on board. So I feel like having these campaigns can help you really spread it much further than you'd expect. And were they receptive to that, the teachers? Yes, yeah. we, we got a lot of support from our teachers, which it was nice because it wasn't just one of those things where we would be part of the school like representing the school but it wasn't reciprocated so we had a lot of support and I think as well the youth-led campaigns just make it so our voices are heard instead of people are putting thoughts into 
youth site like heads and then they're saying it again. I think just opening the conversation is one of the main points. Yes, but it opened the conversation and it gave us a like a safe and comfortable place to speak about it, which I think is like the most beneficial thing because obviously in PSC we weren't quite finding that. So in that we had so much time just to discuss how we were feeling about different topics, so it's really good. And being removed from the school setting in order to do so. Well, potentially we could have field trips on consent outside of school. <laughs> um, any thoughts on that one, Kristen? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree um, uh, with what you've both said. And I think movements like Bold Girls Can is so, are so important and they really galvanise action. Um, I think from my side as a, as a researcher, campaigns are really important to draw attention to the issue and get politicians to sit up and take notice and to, um, to take action. So um, there was a campaign in England called Everyone's Invited. And uh, before that campaign, it was, it was really difficult for organisations to get the government to pay any attention to the problem of sexual harassment in schools. They just weren't, nobody was interested. A lot of school, a lot of school leads said, this doesn't happen in our school. Um, and that, what that campaign did was allow it was just, it was very simple. It just allowed people to anonymously report uh, experiences that had happened to them and at what school. Pretty much every school, is every school is in the UK is now listed on that site. And it, and it makes it impossible for um, policymakers and school leads to say, this isn't an issue, we don't need to prioritise this. Because you, they can now point to that and say, look how many testimonies there are and look how much this goes on and you need to take action. And I know that I've, so I'm, I'm involved in, a, in evaluating an, a whole school approach to gender-based violence, which is taking part across Scotland. It's called um, Equally Safe at School and it's run by Rape Crisis. And so my job as a researcher is to help evaluate how that's going. We tried to get funding um, to evaluate it in, um, I think the first time we tried was 2016, um, to a big uh, funder who funds health research. They weren't interested. Um, and also it was hard for, for to, to tell school. School said, yeah, can see this, but it's not our main priority. Uh, that has all changed now. Um, and people, you know, we've now we've got funding for to evaluate it and people recognise it as an issue. Um, and that's largely to do with, um, you know, campaigns like Bold Girls Can, everyone's invited and people just keeping that message out. So really important campaigns. Yeah, I'm calling for this sorts of education and, yeah. um, I guess with, with Equally Safe being the whole school's approach as part of that evaluation, also evaluating, like Christy had said earlier, around the kind of patchy network, nature of, of consent education across schools and these types of findings, I'm sure, will arise from that. Okay, wonderful. So I think we will now move on to questions. Um, thank you very much. Oh, good. We have a nice, engaged audience. I just love that. Um, OK. So let's go for this one first. What is the relationship between learning about consent and building an overall culture of respect in school? Um, I think there is definitely a large correlation between the two because I think one of the things that we often touched on was consent isn't just about sex like it is just in your day-to-day -day life something as simple as oh can I give you a hug or something like that it might not be as blunt as asking it but you know there is certain things but I think that just shows you have a respect for somebody just asking or ensuring that they feel comfortable as well as you do I do feel before you can obviously talk about uh, sexual relationships and things, you want to talk about consent in just that way of respecting each other. And I think that's something you want to teach younger because then it'll make talking about consent and other concepts far easier when you're older. 
the broadening out beyond sexual education, sexual interactions, it's so important. I'm thinking about in the workplace, what's your levels of comfort around touching or hugging colleagues, for example, negotiating that consent around relationships more broadly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kirsten? Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. I think it's, it's really important to teach it, but it's, I think the culture of the school is really important. I think um, young people are watching their teachers all the time. What kind of behaviours get called out? What kind of behaviours get let, let go? And if they see behaviours not being called out, like, you know, flicking skirts, pulling bra straps, if, if people aren't calling that out, then there is a culture in which the the ideas around consent and respecting other people's boundaries and respecting other people in general it's it's almost like what we're teaching you in consent is it just feels a bit theoretical and um, so i think that whole school environment is really important and um, it needs to go alongside whatever is being taught in the classroom and i think that goes back to your points about it not just being something that psc teachers are on on it yeah. you know you need all all the teachers and um, yeah yeah, calling it out across subjects. Yeah, yeah, and on yeah. The, in the corridors, you know, in the in the canteen, whatever. Um, if I think when when students see a teacher observe something like that and not do anything, that that's a, that they are being they're being taught there. That's an, a powerful message that's coming across, and it undermines everything that the school might try to do in terms of formal messaging. Mm -hmm. Okay, brilliant. That was a great question. Thank you. Do we have teachers in the room? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I hope you're going to understand. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, not to target teachers, and I, I just think that's a great kind of, in terms of the teaching of consent, at some point it would be great to hear. Yeah. yeah. Um, I should say as well, with the post-it notes, please also feel free just to write a comment if you're not comfortable to, to speak or verbalise your comment. If you just want to write feedback or comment on these, you can do. Um, I think that's a really interesting one, and somebody touched on it earlier. I think it might have been uh, yourself, Tia. Should this consent education, RSHP education more broadly, be taught in single gender or mixed gender groups? I think we've always found that it's better mixed because um, obviously Ball Girls Can was just girls, and it was good and it was a safe space, but you want to hear boys' opinions as well because first off means you can teach each other about what the other gender is experiencing but also means you can give your opinions and hear what they're seeing are issues yeah i think it's a lot to do with opening each other's eyes because a lot of the time when you're speaking and what like a group of girls or i don't know about boys but like when we speak in a group of girls a lot of the time you unconsciously back each other up when it comes to a lot of things. So I think hearing a guy say it in a different way or see it in a different way kind of, it gives you a different viewpoint to understand where it's coming from. Yourself, Kirsten? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, without aging myself too much, <laughs> the sex education, to the, to the extent that I received any at school, it was very much, it, um, boys went off to learn about you know how, how boys go through puberty and girls went off to learn about contraception and it was almost like we were these different species we've come a long way since then and i and i've and, and you know i know that my son in primary school was taught about periods and what girls go through as well as what boys go through and that is feels much healthier so i think generally and i i i really agree with you that you can get different viewpoints and different um hearing the other side and i think we need to be you know, careful to bring uh, boys with us as champions of consent and equality and because it's, it, you know, you, we need to avoid them feeling like they're under siege because they're always seen as, you know, the ones, the, the perpetrators or whatever. So we do, we do need to, we need to be in it together. Mm -hmm. However, I would say there are times when a single gender group can be helpful depending on a topic. Uh, so some of the stuff that we're learning from the evaluation of Equally Safe at School is that um, girls are less likely to say that they feel safe talking about issues like gender-based violence at school than boys. So sometimes there can be that safety issue where the dynamics can be such that um, some people will feel like they're kind of 
not wanting to say something or worried about being um, called out or you, you, you know they might or it might be that they've had a difficult experience themselves um, you know including with other boys in the room or girls in the room so I think single single gender groups can be helpful at times but I think you need a mix okay great this question is actually quite kind of related I just could do a quick time check because I don't have a Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, okay. Although it is great that there is a, fa a focus on consent, it feels like most of the conversations seem through a heterosexual lens, which would afford young people, and I think that says afford, in denominational schools. How would you tackle that? I don't know who wrote this question, but it says afford. Sorry, effect. effect, which would affect young people in denominational schools. Uh, how would you tackle that? Um, I know for a fact that we have talked about that before um, and I think it comes back to the examples you're given in PSC. So we often talked about why is it not just a person and person, not man and woman? Because in this day and age, it's not always man and woman. So I think it's just kind of, like we said, keeping up with the times, keeping up with the way things are going I just think some things can be altered so it makes it more inclusive yeah there's definitely this idea that um it's always boys and girls and for that reason this is why like we talk about a lot but like the PSE curriculum it does need to change with the times and include more of these things because otherwise you might make consent like you might bring light to consent in a particular way but then you're missing out a large part of it as well is that something that's also maybe come out of the evaluation or coming out um yeah i mean what what we know from the um, results of the the baseline evaluation is um that student i mean well, particularly if you identify in an, if you identify in another way is your gender or your non-binary or trans um, you're much more likely to report sexual harassment at school. Mm -hmm. So there is that extra, extra um, victimisation that those students experience. Um, and also, if you are, um, um, you know, if you don't identify as heterosexual or you're, you're attracted to same sex uh, people, the, you know, there are vul vulnerabilities there. Um, and I, so I think the, the point that you make about having examples um, is really important. Um, and I, I think the curriculum is, the RSHP curriculum is, is fairly good on that. Whether that's delivered in the classroom is, is again, you know, it can, can, can seem quite, um, can be quite variable. Um, but I think there is, I think, you know, it's important to understand that um, the kind of pressures that girls are under and boys are under. And so that's why when a boy and a girl get together, there are a particular set of pressures that need to be kind of discussed. So boys are under pressure to seem sexually active, to seem kind of like interested in sex. And girls are kind of under, under a lot of pressure to kind of um, be popular but not too sexually available, to look attractive but not like they're asking for it. The, the, so there's all these kind of pressures that we put on on people depending on how they, what gender they, they present, that then come into those interactions um, ar that around consent. And so it, it, you know, we do need to think about them and talk about them and why do people act in certain ways because they're kind of, we're all sort of playing out what society tells us we should be, um, we should be how we should be presenting or what we should be thinking or feeling depending on you know whether we're a boy or a girl or um, yeah um, adapting to those kind of gender stereotypes and norms and yeah that makes um, makes it difficult within a school setting which is I guess because it's enclosed I think do you find that these these roles end up being kind of dramatized almost at that age and stage or that it's, it's more pressure to try and fit in with the norms around gender. Yeah, definitely. I think we we just found it to be quite 
I don't know if old fashioned is the way to say it, but it felt very much like boys have to be this way and girls have to be this way, but they can't do that way without relaxing or they always have to be quite uptight about just the whole topic of any of it. So yeah. I think that's probably why it makes it so difficult to talk about consent. So for that reason you kind of you need to talk about it more almost to like break the awkwardness but also try and like break the stereotypes. Um this is kind of related to that point then around where do you talk about it and how can you talk about it in a safe and an open um, way. So for Trish, um, sorry, for Christy and Tia, um, have you found social media has become a place where you can find info on things like relationships and consent? And do you think the information is accurate? Um, I don't know. I think it's very, you have to make sure where it's coming from. Like, if it's just coming from a random place, you might want to look into a lot more. But at the same time, sometimes you need somebody in person to like, confirm it, to actually be like, yes, this is definitely correct, or this is correct to an extent. Or I think it's just, you definitely need a mix of both. And you don't want to rely on just social media, and you don't want to rely on just the people you're around. But I think it is definitely affected the way that we've picked up and the way that we speak about it as well. Yeah, social media is such a large, Im like it impacts us so largely. And I think that quite often it's not accurate or you don't know if you can trust it. So you do want to have these things confirmed. But I also feel like in terms of stereotypes, it doesn't necessarily improve it, almost makes it worse. Like the stereotypes on social media are so large and like, trends and things you should follow and that's even more um, brought through social media which is why for like Bold Girls Can especially we like always mentioned that social media and online is, needs to be taught more in schools and brought up because it is evolved so much and is so large in our lives now. And fast paced, I think we were talking about this earlier, so how can school curriculums that are developed keep up with the fast paced nature of the digital world, mm -hmm. social media? And I think that is a, a, that's a particular area where the teachers need to be listening to you. It's really hard as a teacher um, and as a parent uh, to keep up because the trends evolve and, you know, I, I mean, my sons will roll my eyes if I try and, you know, <laughs> claim any knowledge about social media. <laughs> because inevitably what I say they'll feel is like, you know, yeah. so last year. Um, and so that, and I think that's a particular um, area where teachers really do want to help and they want to support, but they actually need to understand it f yeah. Yeah. from young it's people. So fast -paced. And I think it's something that you continuously need to hear people's voices about because it is changing all the time. Yeah, we often talked about, like, even as a fifth and sixth year, if you just ask a few people from those year groups about the stuff that they felt they missed in S1 or younger, you would learn a lot more about what you could improve than you'd even begin to think of social media yeah yeah around what the gaps that they looking back had experienced yeah. yeah um okay moving away from schools being a place in which consent is taught in what way do you think the wider society could have an impact e.g youth work or third sector organizations in terms of supporting conversations on consent is there a role out with the school what comes maybe christy I think it's just one of those things where it's back to consent as a taboo subject. But if you just make it less of a taboo subject, then everyone can be part of it. Like it, At the end of the day, the conversations can be started at school, but you can take them away and you can carry on the conversations, which is the main point. Yeah, we were talking about that for Bold Girls Can because obviously in our campaign we're talking about where outside of schools we can try and spread this message and how. And I think there's a lot of, you know, putting posters up everywhere, like 
um, or leaflets. It can, like, the conversation can be started anywhere. So it's just a matter of making sure that people realise that because I think at the moment it's very much a, oh, we don't want to talk about that. That's awkward. That, yeah. I think it just comes back to a willingness mm -hmm. to actually talk about it and actually listen to people's different viewpoints on it because not everybody has the same experiences. So. I'd agree. I think there are sometimes really um, well handled stories in um, in TV programs. Like I think there's an episode of Netflix series Sex Education that handles um, a, a non consensual experience on a bus. Um, does it really sensitively? Really brings out what it was like for the for the girl and the sort of complexity of how she felt about it. Um, and, and yeah, so actually just being able to refer back to those kinds of experiences um, are really helpful. And I, th I think, you know, it's on the news a lot. Um, and so that is a sort of natural way to spark conversations as well. Um, but partly about call it, sometimes you just, um, so there'll be a news event uh, I can't remember the actually, but there was a news event recently and then some police commissioner gets up and says something that's extremely victim blaming and then the next day loses their job. So, rightly, so that sort of thing can kind of generate conversations there around um, events, particular events. Yeah. And I guess having the, the opposite effect and thinking around kind of like big films or Netflix series that have been heavily criticised around not handling these topics well, it's still a way, I guess, of inciting that conversation out with the school setting. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I personally wish more of the conversation was about uh, communication and respect. Because uh, I do worry slightly that the focus, you know, it's on the news and, and it's... And it, it all becomes, yeah, quite heavy and it's all about the negative things. and. And yeah, I just I think the in our in the day to day lives um, we need to be kind of looking. We need the, the the kind of skills that we need to all be learning is how to respect other people, how to know that we're being respected ourselves or not, um, and and just how to communicate about. Um, sensitive things including including sex and so uh, that's the thing that i wish there was more conversation about um because yeah um it's really interesting interested to hear your thoughts on that should we be moving away from the language of just consent towards communication respect i think consent starts with respect yeah. like if you're respecting somebody you're you understand that their consent is important so I think that's one of the things you just need to look at and take a step back and look at the bigger picture. It's not just this one tiny part of it. It's just how to be a decent human being at the end of the day. Yeah, I'd 100% agree with what you said. It, they need to make it look more in the positive, look at all the ways that you can be respectful and you can give consent instead of all the focus on the bad things that happen. I was thinking that could that shift it from then this idea that consent is black and white and that consent is or what you were saying earlier, Christy, around often being taught the most extreme examples of consent not being given as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I wonder if this is potentially from somebody in the room who is um, either a teacher or somebody who's also a fellow researcher in this area because they have done some research into RSHB education this year um, and young people use words such as boring and vague to describe content. <laughs> um, I guess, is that is that something you would agree with, um, Christy and Tia, but also what could change this? Any thoughts or ideas, suggestions? I think a large part of that is talking to the pupils, getting their opinions, because obviously we talked about like getting their opinions on things they feel they've missed, but also they will be the ones who know how they can be taught. So getting ideas from them on how they will benefit and what would make them feel like engaging more could be beneficial and really help with the whole, it's boring. Yeah, I think I, could find myself agreeing with that. Like, oftentimes it can just be a bit like, we've got PSE, whatever the teacher's saying, um, 
yeah, sure, whatever, we'll move on now, is what it often felt like. But I think that also had a lot to do with sometimes it felt the people that were teaching it weren't really, it was they were more ticking the box than actually sitting down, learning, having a discussion. And I think it's one of those things where it could be sometimes learning it the way that it was taught was often like it felt like you were going to have an exam at the end of the year so you had to learn these things but you don't it is just a this is information you need to know you need to be engaging in it so even something as simple as making it just slightly less formal and slightly more just a conversation like yeah obviously they do need to say certain things but like making it more of a chat making it more of a we're comfortable to talk about this we shouldn't be straying away from it yeah i definitely feel if they just they need to make the pse class a safe space more of a conversation like what we did for Bulls girls ken was not boring <laughs> um it was more of a sit down discussion and it meant that people engaged and they wanted to talk about it Whereas at the moment, PSE feels like, a, oh, we have to, we have to listen. And I, like from my PSE class especially, I felt like the class didn't engage and that made it difficult. They didn't speak, they just got spoken at. So it does need to be made more of a conversation. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I completely agree with that. It's, it's not really like, I think, um, sex and relationships education is not like other parts of the curriculum. I personally think the best way to teach any subject is to, to make it participatory and get people involved in learning. But particularly, I think these topics, because they are so personal and people's individual experiences actually really matter. I mean, you can learn, say, I'm randomly picking geography, I don't know why, um, regardless of you know your own personal experience. But when we talk about something like um, sex, and consent, everyone's coming from their own experience, whether it's from a household where these issues aren't discussed, it may be from a history of trauma, um, and, and that includes for the teachers. And I think it's a big ask, to be honest, to, for teachers to um, just, you know, moving through the topic, sex and consent is just like any other topic, because actually that teacher themselves may have grown up with all sorts of, um, myths or shame or bad experiences that make it really hard and awkward for them to talk about it and so i think if you're feeling like that yourself then you withdraw into that just let me get this lesson plan out let's 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 finish so if we had the resources i think just extra time with teachers on helping them actually think about how who it is that they are coming to the coming to the topic um, and I, th I mean I think the resources are there online for lots of participation and discussion groups and so it's maybe also about young people um, saying to their teachers have you seen that these resources are here can we can we um, can we do that how can we have this discussion um, they're all there you know you can just click on rshb.scot and they're all there um, so maybe just um, that's a, maybe a campaign strategy. <laughs> Just, uh, including, um, nice to come on to this actually, because including the Bold Girls Ken resources, which are also available on the um, RSHP website. But yes, is it is it students, pupils or teachers' jobs to seek those resources? But I think that this is part of bringing young people in into these conversations that then we can sign posts as well. Um, in light of not wanting the teacher to feel too <laughs> directed at, is there anything you wanted to, to say briefly on, on that yeah, point? I think, it's, I think it's so challenging because um, whenever, whenever you look at, I'm from a modern studies background, so I have studied, you know, I studied all of those things that you know, came in, into a school with the idea of teaching that. I think in a structural level in a school, it's different in different schools, but your PIC teachers are generally what was known as a guidance teacher. and over the course of years, I think that job has expanded out massively. So I think that started as a kind of pastoral role and I don't carry out that job, but I do know that what can, what can often happen is they are, they are inundated with everything that comes from parents. The structural systems that used to happen, you used to have people who sat underneath them and would kind of field things from students. So I do think there's an element of the PIC curriculum where it's not at the forefront of their job. 
and it is it's almost that they're they're not specialists they haven't trained to teach person on social education they are geography teachers they're maths teachers they're english teachers who've come in to teach in and i think there's a kind of discussion sometimes around do you need to have teacher training for people who want to go straight to that pastoral role or do you have people coming in who maybe do a few years in pe and then they end up teaching pse and again it's not their specialism and then the other kind of structural side of things are things are so tight in a budgetary setting that we, I don't know, certainly in our school have non-specialists, so non-pupil support teachers teaching PSE who have been asked to take it because they've got a period that aligns with it. And I know from some of them within um, my own department, they've kind of raised concerns about teaching things like consent this year because they don't have the training behind it. But you, it, it, so it's, there's that, that kind of structural challenge in a school. Um, and then I guess the kind of the setup of lessons so if you were in a maths lesson or a modern studies lesson there is that kind of pressure i suppose on teachers or, or as you should be doing to make those lessons kind of interactive and interesting and i just don't think that's really as expanded to, the, to, to pse in the same way so because other subjects are results driven we would have meetings about the way that you're delivering things and i do think there's that tick box you in a, in a fifth year you've got to get through ucas applications consent um, vaping, drugs, alcohol, they're probably, as when you count the amount of weeks in a school year, it ends up being a tick box exercise. So it is, there are a lot of challenges and I do think, I think it probably starts from a kind of longer term rethinking how you, how you filter people into pupil support and allowing them, if they want to do a teacher training, I'd, loads of people come in and they know they only want to do a few years before they become a guidance teacher. So if you actually let them do their postgrad education the same way that I did in their subject, then you would have teachers coming out that maybe would be able to have those conversations in a more kind of in a more educated way because they had that background. So I think it's every school will have its own challenges, but I think there are probably changes you could make at a structural level, but they would take quite a long time to filter through. But I do like what you've said as well about people voice and listening to listening to the students and letting that inform the curriculum. I just think that comes through more so in subjects, the curricular subjects than it does ever in PSE. Yeah. But. It's really interesting to just hear on that side as well. Any reflections on that? Is that similar or echo what you've been finding, Kirsten? Yeah, I mean, I suppose as running the evaluation for Equally Safe at School, I've had quite a lot of conversations with um, they're generally guidance teachers or school leadership um, with deciding whether or not they want their school to take part in Equally Safe at School. Um, and the people I talk to are extremely dedicated um, and really want to make their school a safer place. I just think you've summed up the challenges really well. They've just got so many demands on their time. Um, and a lot of them are actually, their, their role is just as much kind of a, almost a social work role, helping the, the students who are really need that extra support. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I can totally see how PSE gets get squeezed. But I think the, the, the focus that we have now on results is to the, to, to the detriment of of more subjects aimed at um, sending young people out with good esteem and well-being. And we do have a health and well-being agenda, which I think is much stronger than even, you know, other countries. It, there is a stronger health and well-being agenda, I think, in Scotland that you, than, than I've certainly seen in other countries. Um, but even so, I think, yeah, results tend to trump every, other things so I don't know whether whether if you make PSE an examined uh, subject whether that would change things but I'm not sure I'm not sure that would be the right way to go and does that yeah um, I, I think that is a point that we often brought up it was like PSE was just the subject that you had to take but it also felt oftentimes that the PSE the guidance teachers were that was very low down on their list which was understandable especially with the things that have been going on over the past couple of years but it just felt quite like unless you had a flashing problem you were just kind of we'll do it when we can if we can here's what we have to do this is the box we've ticked because like, we often found that one week we could be doing something about consent and then the next week we were doing stuff about taxes and it was like, 
where was the flow? Where did that link into each other? And even that just would help with engagement, like just having it slightly more, here's the flow of the year instead of a week before exams, here's stuff that we have missed out from the year, let's go. Yeah, like we, we definitely saw the challenges because like for us, our, everyone in our year had PSE at the same time. So it did mean that all the teachers were meant to be, all the guidance teachers were meant to be teaching, which made it difficult because then if guidance were needed, they were having to be taken away from teaching our classes. So it it is really challenging. And like, I think we see that. So like, almost like if we can like, see how to change the curriculum and the order in which it's taught, it might benefit them and help them to be able to know, right, okay, we can just do that now. And they don't have to then like, go, oh, how can I teach this better? How can I order it better? So, yeah. And make it more interactive and everything else that, that the suggestions have come up. Um, okay, just to say which one. Do you, I think it's an important one and an important conversation more broadly, and it was touched on earlier by you, Kristen, around, sorry, Kirsten, the the disconnect potentially between what parents are teaching and conversing around consent with what educators are. Do you think that that might have an impact on student engagement and learning? Um, and if so, what could be done to improve this? Should we bring the parents into the classroom for PSE? Or? Um, it's very difficult. Uh, I think schools play a really important role in um, getting across uh, values around equality and respect. And not all um, um, students who come to school come from homes where those, those are the values. Um, and I think, some, so some of the teachers I've been speaking to more recently said that they noticed that uh, an effect over the pandemic um, because of the, I mean, PSC stopped and, you know, alongside everything else. But I think that particularly, um, you know, was one of the things that got dropped and, and, and students weren't coming into the school environment where those cultures were kind of, so not just in the teaching, but in the values. Um, and so they did notice, and I suppose young people were spending more time on social media at that time. And there is that issue that I'm sure everyone's familiar about, about that algorithm getting sucked into an algorithm about misogyny. And, 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 and so, and I think if, parents are particularly important I think in um, countering those kind of those you know from, from recognizing when their their children might be getting sucked down into one of those algorithms and, and challenging it um, but also I just think as role models I think what a young person learns about respect in a relationship is going to be less about what their parents say to them than how their parents relate to each other um, and so that sort of sets the blueprint. So I actually think the most important thing that parents can do is show each other respect. Um, and, 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 that, and then that, that's, that, that those kind of values go in. Maybe offset some of the misogyny, for example, algorithms on social media, etc. What is there any thoughts on that, Christine, to you? I think that was, when we first came together, we talked a lot about how we don't, just we didn't just want our message to be shown through schools like we wanted it to be to go out to parents professionals just anyone that would listen because at the end of the day going back to the point of the school starts the conversation when it comes to young people but it's everyone else's job to keep that conversation going but i also think there is a lot to do with the generational gap where it was the way that a lot of parents were taught it in complete opposite rights and respects to how we're doing it. And they were a lot more, this is wrong, this is right, this is like a lot more black and white than how a lot of people have been taught it in recent years. Yeah, I do feel like obviously children are going to learn from the parents, but almost parents could start learning from the children mm -hmm. because the same way as listening, like schools listening to the younger opinions, um, I think parents hearing what their children are experiencing or how they feel about how things are being taught could also have a large benefit because 
like you said, they were taught differently and they were taught different things that maybe have changed, especially because of social media. Like you said, you didn't understand it. And um, I think a large part of like consent and respect is parents being able to like understand what their children are going through. So kind of too weak, yeah. Sorry to add to that. I, I think it, that consent is a particular, um, particularly important because most parents were not taught about consent. It's really recent. So the current generation of young people know much more about it, um, depending on how well they were taught. But they do, they, you know, it's a conversation that happens in schools that didn't happen even 10 years ago. Um, and so actually a lot of the learning for this, I think, does go from young people to, the, to their parents. Um, and uh, yeah, because I, I think across now, you know, we're having people who are sort of re finding new partners in, in midlife. They've never had that sort of kind of consent conversation, but they're aware of it and, you know, be, being talked about in media and things, but not necessarily really discussing it like, like um, your generation has. Yeah. Even things like, you know, the rise of dating websites and dating apps and how that's potentially shifted things like consent that young people could probably educate um, parents around who might then, as you say, be looking for relationships later on in life or second relationships as well, how all of those boundaries have probably shifted. Um, um, this is a really interesting one and it kind of relates, I guess, to who is in the room. Um, how can we get boys on board and interested in topics like this? Um, although I think that you did say modern study. Are you a modern studies class? They got the choice out of the three panels, and okay. I did make past comment, and you've heard me say this before, but this is who chose to, came to the, come to the consent one, and we do have boys with us, but they're in the games okay. development, or whatever that one is, which is great, but yeah, it's um, kind of telling, I suppose, in terms of the interest, and we do see that it's not, as a subject, the classes are play, pretty split, so we've got about half boys, half girls with us today, but I, I think the, the interest in it kind of depends on... Yeah, uh, well, so this question is, is really fitting then. How do we, and maybe if, if there are people in the room who, who have this, this experience that they want to share, but this one's particularly directed at yourself, Kirsten. Um, obviously, the audience being largely female, are boys not here because they don't think it affects them or because they think that they already know this stuff? Uh, <laughs> it's really interesting. It's something I think about a lot. Um, I have three boys um, and, uh, you know, they're absolutely fantastic. And I, so I do talk to them at this about it because um, I think they all have a good understanding of consent and, I, and the older two are now in relationships and I, and I see them being respectful um, and I see them doing things that when I was young just weren't part of the scene. So my, um, my eldest was talking about how if they're going out clubbing as a group, they'll be looking out for each other. And if someone goes to the bathroom, they'll be covering the drink or, you know, they're, they're, they're looking out for everyone in the group. And I think that's a sort of consciousness that wasn't there, certainly, you know, um, back in my day. Um, but equally, I haven't seen any of them kind of... <laughs> Gets, gets stuck in in the issues. I think, I think it does come, I think it's, it, I think when you are, um, there's a kind of, I think, you know, the issues, it is, it is young women um, who are more often um, victims. It is something that they have to think about more. They can't always take their safety for, for granted. And so they, um, and there are lots of situations in which they feel unsafe. So it is, and when you are in that situation where you can't, it can't be assumed, those things can't be assumed, you do think about it more and you are more motivated and you are more wanting to try and address this. Um, I think um, for boys, it, it can feel a more maybe it, um, exposing. It's, 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 it's maybe seen as not cool to be, you know, they're very, every, I mean, everyone's concerned, at, at, you know, when you're going through high school about your reputation, reputation management, um, and you don't really want to do anything that's going to mark, mark you out as doing something different. 
um, and for, for boys to get involved in issues like this, that does mark them out as being more different from other boys than it does for a girl to take part versus other girls. So I think it is an extra, an extra step. I also think um, boys can be a bit later than girls in kind of gaining the confidence to get, um, to, get act, to get into activism or to really start to sort of engage in these issues, but it can come. And, and I think um, the, you know, what we need to do is getting them on board as, as, as champions. Um, and I mean, I always encourage, um, I do encourage my boys to call themselves feminists. I think that's, and, and they do. I just think it's really, that's really important because the people recognizing that feminism isn't just something that women call themselves. If you are interested in equal rights, then that's, you're, you, you know, you're a feminist and owning, and really owning that term. Those kinds of small things can really help. Um, Call them, um, my favourite expression is like, call them in, don't call them out. And I know I also um, raised three young boys, the eldest kind of going through some of this early education and feeling a sense of going into these situations as if it's going to be, he's going to be the target almost. And I guess, yeah, within those, those contexts, trying to bring boys into those conversations and champion these, these issues as well would be important. Uh, I guess on the other hand, and this is a really pertinent question, it is estimated that one in three girls in school have experienced sexual harassment or violence. So how do you navigate consent education delivery when students may have experienced this from their peers within that class setting? We'll start with... I think it's... It's back to make a safe space. Make it comfortable. Make it so you know that you can step out if you need to without feeling judged and you know that there'll be support if you do step out and you do want to talk but at the same time finding a way where people can express these concerns without them having to feel like all the pressure or all eyes are on them I think it's a way of almost finding a balance between speaking out but feeling like you're still safe at the same time. Yeah, I also, having the opportunity to, maybe not personally, but just like a general broad thing of discussing how, um, like experiences and also like, as we said before, like having that mix boys and girls so that almost you can talk to the boys about things maybe they don't realise um, isn't right and that, and I think we've found that like boys in our school, they're like willing to speak about it, but maybe they don't realise what it is or how it affects them. So I think having this discussion and being able to communicate in groups of both boys and girls is really important. Okay. Kirsten? Yeah, I mean, it's really tricky because um, quite often incidents of sexual harassment do occur in within friendship groups um, and and they can be so hard to um, uh, to respond to and I think just yeah being aware that those dynamics might exist in the classroom and just maybe to talk about something that's um, adjacent to that but slightly different I think um, it supporting schools and how they respond to incidents of sexual harassment is really important and um, because I think that how those incidents are managed gets around a school. Um, sometimes the information isn't always accurate, but that then affects how confident other people feel to come forward. Um, and quite often what happens when, when young people are uh, brave enough to, to come forward, um, when it is a young woman, often it's the young woman who is the one who then ends up making the adjustment. So she's the one who's moved out or she's the one who then doesn't feel able to come to school because she's, um, her, you know, mental health is suffering as a result. And then just being in that same classroom as that boy is really, really upsetting. Um, and sometimes there aren't any consequences for the boy. They, 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 they just continue. So I think it's really important in, in how, how that schools are able to uh, respond to those situations really sensitively, manage the confidentiality of the people involved, get all sides of the story, but make sure that it's not the, the, the young woman coming forward who ends up then 
getting the additional consequences in addition to what you know what what they've already experienced. So. Okay, brilliant. Um, okay, we have two questions left, and I've got one to save. So we'll do this one. What if there was kind of one thing that you would like educators to know or to do about educational consent? What would it be? I think making it less of a making it less of a chore almost to teach like just kind of making sure that it's brought up in more than just your PSE like when it comes when it becomes part of an everyday conversation or something that's a little bit more relaxed to talk about or this that and the next thing you are more likely to take something away from it instead of switching off when they're just people speaking at you like make sure you're speaking to them not at them yeah i feel like it's everything we've already discussed just making sure that everyone feels comfortable and safe in the room because that's when they're going to be willing to talk about these things and communicate about it so yeah i think that's most important um, I think I'd probably go back to a few things that I've said before around um, uh, framing it positively and seeing it as something that um, it's, it's a negotiation, it's a process, it's mutual, it's around uh, being with somebody and um, uh, behaving with each other because you love you because you you know you res you're respecting them and you're wanting to have and you know a good time together. Um, and that you know those are the skills to be developing um, we need to know you know fundamentally that um, you know the the boundaries of, of, of what is a consensual experience but there's so many positive aspects to it it's not just about the legal side of it yeah. great yeah I love that, that we, we treat this as something within the structural constraints, I think, um, mentioned earlier, which I completely agree with, that it's something that, that is a positive conversation. Um, and then that relates back, Christy, to what you were saying around not just the kind of, you know, one side of the spectrum to the other in terms of the most um, kind of dramatic incidents, but how do we create these safe, compassionate, open spaces to have these honest, um, transparent dialogues together? Okay, brilliant. We... I have one final question that I really would like to ask, but before I do, um, and I think it's an opportune time to ask it, before I do, I just want to give the panellists a final opportunity to give any reflections or to sum up the discussion, um, and we could just maybe go back the way, um, some or key takeaways from the discussion for you or that you would like the audience to take away from today. Um, it's been a real pleasure to be sharing the stage with you. I think you are the, you know, the, what, what gives us all hope, you know, for the next generation, just the, the courage that it takes to set up something like Bold Girls Ken and the influence that you're having in schools and with educators. So just to encourage you to, to keep going with that and, and, and anyone in the audience who might feel inspired um, to take up that cause. Um, it's been lovely to hear from our, our, our teacher and just that, that, that side of things. Um, and, and, I, and I do completely appreciate all the pressures that schools are under. So I don't want to, to I'm sorry if it's come across that I'm, if I'm uh, uh, bashing educators, I'm fully aware of how, how hard that is. Um, but yeah, I would like to say if we were to run this again, that we've got, you know, we've, we've got a room full of mostly women and it would be great if, we ran it again and we had equal numbers of men and women interested in this topic. I think that would be fantastic. Okay, and Tia? Um, well, obviously it's, it's not an easy topic and it's not, not easy to solve and it is going to be difficult, obviously, having, like, getting people enthusiastic about it and actually wanting to speak about it is difficult. So I think the main message would be just not to let it be a taboo subject and just feel confident that you can speak about these things and that there, other people are experiencing the same thing, they'll probably want to speak about it as well. And like we found that through Bold Girls Can that there were people who have experienced the same as us, or similar at least. So there are people who want to speak about it, and boys as well, Like we found they do want to discuss it, they maybe just 
don't realise. So don't make it a taboo subject. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I think that is one of the key points is just making sure that everyone feels comfortable, but also ask young people. Like, you won't know unless you ask them. See where you feel like people have gone wrong, where they've gone right, what you can learn from, not only what you've done bad, but like what you've done good. Like there is good points in all of our education, but I think it's just realizing that we can always, we're always adapting, we always need to adapt, but just kind of taking a moment to reflect and actually realize it's not just this is what we need to do. It's something that we should do. Great. Brilliant. Thank you very much. We have one final um, question. And just in case we have, I don't think we have any politicians in the room today, but hopefully they will watch this back tomorrow. So since we are in the Scottish Parliament, what role do you think MSPs have on the topic of consent? Is there an ask here, a call to action from our members of Parliament? I think it's just the willingness, the willingness to actually do something about it and to help, even just listen. It's just actually taking the time out of their day to be like, okay, this is what everyone, your day-to-day -day person is thinking about it and seeing where they can help and where they can go from there. Yeah, I really just think that obviously politicians are the one who will probably be the most hard so we really want them to carry on the conversation and talk about it and make people realise that it's not an awkward subject because they're speaking about it to important people. So. Person? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's great that we have the Equally Safe strategy that's focusing priorities and resources towards um, equality and safety across um, across the board um, so I just I guess just to keep up that momentum um, there's so much pressure on public spending at the moment but not not to let that drop just to, to, to keep up that um, that focus okay brilliant well let's hope some of our members of parliament watch this back tomorrow um, because they're all very pertinent points Okay, thank you very much to our panellists uh, for all of your contributions to the event, um, but also to our engaged audience members who have come along um, and to the Young Women's Movement team who have been here in a support role as well. Um, and for all your great work with Bold Women's Ken um, alongside our other co-created and co-designed programmes with young people and young women. Um, we must end there, however, um, but I would like to thank you all for coming along today and making such a big contribution via your questions and engagement. Um, I'd like to yep, just again thank um, sorry, Christy, Tia and Kirsten um, for coming along and your input and your insights, um, our partners at the Young Women's Movement and, of course, at the Scottish Parliament more broadly. Um, if you'd like to know more about the work that Tia and Christy have been involved in through Bold Women's Ken, um, you can find more information on the Young Women's Movement website. We also have physical copies of resources um, here for you to take away, should you wish to, and we'd be very pleased if you would. Um, and can I also just remind everyone to fill in the survey that you will receive automatically if you booked to come along to today via the Eventbrite link. Uh, we also have a few paper copies, if you did not, that would be great if you were willing to fill in, um, probably just as we leave, leave the room. Um, and may I also take this opportunity to remind you that there are more festival events taking place throughout the day, um, all up until Friday the 23rd of August. These include sexism in the workplace taking place at 1pm today. And at 3.30 we have 25 years of the Scottish Parliament, Where Are the Young Women? Plus, we have the Climate Cafe taking place all day today, um, which is outside here. Uh, we can get directions if you ask the Young Women's team to where that is. So I do hope that you're able to stick around and join us at some of those events. Um, and I would just like to finish by thanking you all for being in attendance and your engagement, and a particular thanks to our panellists for joining us and contributing today. So thank you.